Welcome to the History of the Sanhedrin, Part 2. And we left off with the destruction of the Second Temple around the year 70 of the Common Era. And the Sanhedrin, far away from Jerusalem in the coastal city of Yavne. And they were spared thanks to the intercessions of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And this Sanhedrin in Yavne is going to become the epicenter of the Jewish world. Though the pride of the nation, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, which was standing for 420 years, is now destroyed, and tens or perhaps hundreds of thousands of Jews have been massacred by the Romans, thanks to Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai's negotiations with Vespasian, they managed to salvage the beating heart of the nation, the great sages of the Sanhedrin, hiding out in the city of Yavne. And over the next several decades, they're going to orchestrate an unprecedented renaissance to stabilize the nation, to comfort the nation, to galvanize them, to rebuild and restore the prominence of yore. And they succeeded in breathing life back into the soul of a depressed nation. Now, the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem marked a turning point in the leadership structure of the nation. During this time, the Sanhedrin and the Torah leadership, they're going to assume the mantle of absolute authority over the nation. And we spoke about it a little bit in part one. It's been 400 years since the Jewish nation had had prophets or kings or lines of legitimate high priests. And the Sanhedrin was already considered the highest Torah voice in the nation prior to the destruction. However, before the decimation of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, there were other contenders for the loyalty of the nation. The Sanhedrin was the chief Torah authority, but there were other imposters who were trying to jockey for the heir of the Jewish nation. So, of course, there were the local proxy leaders of the Romans and the various warring Jewish factions that we spoke about last time. There were the Essenes, the Sadducees, the Hellenists, Jewish Christians. Now, after the temple's destroyed, all those that wanted to curry favor with the Romans, they now realize that they were mistaken. And all those other groups that are not focused on Torah and Torah leadership and maintaining the tradition, they all disintegrate. And now all you have left is the Sanhedrin and its great sages, and they are now the unquestioned leaders of the nation, both from a Torah perspective and from a political perspective, as we will see. Thus, in a weird way, the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem and the Roman decimation following the Great Revolt of 66 actually yielded a positive outcome, because now all those other groups that were fighting for the helm and for the leadership of the nation and for the heart of the nation, they're all scattered, they're all gone, all you have left is Torah and the Sanhedrin. And therefore, the Sanhedrin is going to expand its responsibilities to political matters. And they're going to conduct foreign policy and negotiate on behalf of the nation. This is sort of interesting. We don't think of rabbis as being politicians or vice versa. They're usually distinct. But we know Moshe, of course, is the quintessential Jewish leader, and he was the political leader and the religious leader and everything. King David the same. He's the greatest rabbi, the greatest scholar. He's the authority. And that is, ideally, we should have leadership in all disciplines coalesced into one body or one individual. And now we see that the rabbis are the religious leaders, the Torah leaders, and they're now going to be also the political leaders, and they're going to be viewed by the Romans as the legitimate, rightful representatives of their Jewish subjects. So the great rabbis of Yavne, now they are going to be led by a triumvirate. There's going to be Rabbi Gamliel, he's the Nasi, and the two greatest scholars are Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Eliezer. And they take frequent trips to Rome to advocate on behalf of the Jews. In fact, the Talmud actually says that right after the temple is destroyed, or a decade or so afterwards, they sent a delegation to visit Titus, who became, after his father died, 
he became the Roman emperor, and they wanted a petition to alleviate the oppressions of Rome towards the Jews. And by the time they get there, Titus has been assassinated by his brother Domitian, and they didn't end up meeting with the Roman emperor after all. But there's many episodes in the Talmud that record Rabbi Gamliel, who was the Nasi, the leader of the Jews, immediately following the destruction. He's on a boat, for example. Many times we see him, and he's always on a boat. He's always traveling to uh, visit the leaders on behalf of the nation. Uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania, the aforementioned part of the triumvirate of Yavne, he was particularly gifted as a diplomat and as a statesman and as a representative and advocate for the Jewish people. He was the Jewish debate ca- champion. And in fact, there's dozens maybe of episodes in the Talmud where the Roman Caesar comes over and says to Rabbi Yeshua, tell me this, that, and the other. And various other Roman noblemen would approach Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania and to hear the Jewish perspective on any given issue. He was essentially the liaison or the advisor of Caesar on Jewish affairs. And even later on, the next generation, uh, Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Yezra's student, the famous Rabbi Akiva, there's a whole host of episodes that we find where he's talking to all the various Roman leaders and, and emperors and Caesars, in particular, the Roman procurator whose name uh, in Hebrew is Ternus Rufus or Tinius Rufus. He was the one overseeing Judea at the time, and there's many instances where him and Rabbi Kiva have discussions that are recorded in the Talmud, and an interesting little twist on history. After Rabbi Kiva's wife dies, Ternus Rufus's <clears throat> wife converts to Judaism, and according to the Talmud of the Book of Nadarim, Rabbi Kiva actually marries the wife of his sparring mate, his Roman sparring mate, Ternus Rufus. Uh, later on in the 130s and 140s, Rabbi Kiva's student, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he sent on a diplomatic mission to Rome to intercede upon their behalf in a very dramatic story how he manages to successfully advocate that the Romans rescind the decrees of Hadrian. And there's many, many such examples. But in short, we now see that the rabbis of the Sanhedrin are accepted by all to be the representatives of the nation. Not only does the entire nation look to them for Torah leadership and accept their authority and follow them and submit themselves to the Sanhedrin and its rabbis and the Nasi, but even the Romans, for all matters of state and politics, the rabbis are now in charge. But it's important to stress, certainly immediately after the temple was destroyed, Yavna was spared, but they still had to tread very lightly. Things weren't all that rosy. They didn't have a long leash from the Romans. Now, the Nasi at the time of the destruction was Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, the great-grandson of Hillel. And he was assassinated by the Romans, along with the high priest, the last high priest that the Jewish nation had, whose name was Rabbi Shmuel ben Elisha. And these are considered two, the first two, of the ten martyrs. What's called in Hebrew the Asare Harude Malchus, the ten martyrs who were killed by the kingdom, which means these were the ten great sages who were killed by the Romans during the 70 years following the destruction, so roughly from the year 70 to the year 140. And the reason why they particularly targeted these two people, because they were the leaders. One was the Nasi, one was the high priest. Now his son, Rabbi Shum Gamliel's son, whose name is Gamliel, Gamliel II, alternatively called Rabban Gamliel of Yavne, for him to go out in the open and coordinate himself as Nasi, he just makes himself a target because they just assassinated his father. He's young. He really is being groomed to be the next Nasi. But now the Romans see red in their eyes. So he kind of lays low for a little bit and for a period following the destruction, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was not a direct descendant of Hillel, is not kind of from the Davidic line, but he was the most senior sage, he becomes the interim Nasi. And he moves to Yavne. And then once things quiet down a little bit, Rabban Gamliel is able to come out of hiding and assume 
his position as the Nasi, as the head of the Sanhedrin, as the political leader of the Jewish people. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, in order to allow the young Nasi, Rabbi Amlil, to flourish and to spread his wings and to not be overshadowed by his presence, he leaves Yavne, moves to Borochayil to allow the leadership of Yavne and the Sanhedrin to be unquestioned in the hands of Rabban Gamliel. But as Yavne flourished, and every Jewish city from all over the Jewish world would send their best and brightest students to Yavne to go study under the tutelage of the Sanhedrin, and it's emerging as this new hub of Jewish life, the Romans, they get somewhat wary uh, of the Sanhedrin, and their patient grows thin, and they nearly renege on their pledge of immunity and almost attacked the Sanhedrin. The security of the Sanhedrin was very much in question. And thus, over the next few decades, the assembly of the Sanhedrin is going to have to go underground several times. They're going to have to move locations frequently. They move to Usha, they move back to Yavne, they move back to Usha, they move to Shvaram. And even temporarily disband and reconvene when the conditions allowed. In fact, the Talmud gives two episodes, once in the book of Sanhedrin on page 74, and once in the book of Kiddushin on page 40b, of great rabbis hiding out in the attic of someone by the name of Nitzah in the city of Lud, and they're discussing Torah matters while they're hiding from the Romans, which shows that even after the temple is destroyed and Yavne is allowed to exist, the great rabbis still have a target on their back. And over the course of those decades, sometimes had to actually flee and hide for their lives in some random guy's attic. And in fact, it's interesting, in the book of Sanhedrin, page 74, it records what their discussion was. What are these great rabbis discussing in the loft, in the attic of Nitzah and Lud, with the high of the Romans? The great question of under what circumstances, what conditions must a Jew die in martyrdom and not commit grievous sins? The Talmud that talks about the three cardinal sins that someone, that a Jew is obligated to give up their life and not transgress, that discussion happened and was codified while they were hiding from the Romans, and while the whole notion of martyrdom was very much uh, contemporaneous and topical to the time that they were living in. This shows that things weren't always so pleasant. In addition, the Romans actually issued an edict for the execution of the Nasi Rabban Gamliel. And the Talmud of the book of Tainus, page 29a, tells the story, this is roughly in the year 90 or so, that the Romans sent a messenger with an edict that you must go and execute and assassinate Rabban Gamliel, the Nazi of the Jewish people. They're getting too strong. Their influence is getting too powerful. We want to subject them. We want to submit them. We don't want them to flourish we have to take out their leadership. We're going to kill Rabbi Gamliel. So this Roman had uh, second thoughts about it. And he lets Rabbi Gamliel find out about it. Rabbi Gamliel himself goes into hiding. And then he meets clandestinely with Rabbi Gamliel. And he tells him, if I find a way to revoke, to undo, to annul this decree... Will you guarantee me that I get a place in the afterlife? And Rabbi Gamaliel responds in the affirmative. And this heroic Roman messenger climbs into the roof, jumps off, commits suicide, and Romans had a rule that if there is an edict that is given to an individual person and they die while trying to execute that edict, that edict gets annulled. And thus Rabbi Rabbi Gamaliel was spared. And what this shows is that this is the, the Sanhedrin is, is alive and they're allowed to exist and allow, allowed to convene, but not for so long and not continuously, and things are still very chaotic. 
And even this relative calm after the destruction is going to be upended by a later Roman administration, Hadrian. When Hadrian becomes emperor, he's going to reinstitute very, very harsh conditions that are going to make this in Hadrian impossible to convene. Now, in Yavne, they had a very robust agenda. The Jewish nation was facing its most challenging circumstances, certainly since the times of the Greeks and Antiochus, but most likely even beforehand since the times of the Babylonian exile, or maybe possibly the most challenging times ever. And the temple has been destroyed, and who knows it, if it will be rebuilt anytime soon. The Babylonian destruction of the first temple, it only lasted for 70 years. 70 years later, the temple was rebuilt by Ezra, amongst others. As we know now, the second temple was destroyed in the year 70, and by the time of this recording, 2018, it has not yet been rebuilt. So we're talking about 1900 years already have passed, and the temple, which is the epicenter of Jewish life, which normative Jewish living really can only exist when there is a temple, well, we haven't had that in so long. And therefore, they sought out to try to strengthen and support and stabilize the Jewish nation for a world where the temple is not existing and where the majority of Jews are living in Babylon. So they made a bunch of edicts that are of note, for example— They wanted to memorialize the temple sacrifices and services, but of course you can't make sacrifices, you can't make services outside of the temple. And therefore they decided that on the holiday of Sukkot, Jews worldwide should shake the lulav and esrog to fulfill the mitzvah of the four species of the holiday. For seven days they should shake the lulav, because Previously, before the temple was destroyed, only in the temple grounds itself was the mitzvah of Lulav and Esrog fulfilled for seven days. Elsewhere, it was only for day one. In order to kind of live the way the temple was, even after the temple's destroyed, they issued a decree that you're going to shake the Lulav and Esrog for seven days outside of the temple. In addition, you'll blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, which falls out on Shabbos in Yavne. Like we've spoken about before, they made an intensified effort to ferret out the last of the Judeo-Christians, the last of the Jews who were secretly Christian, and they instituted in Yavna the 19th blessing to the Shemona Esrei, to the Amidah service, the one which is against heretics, and they forced, or they requested, all those who were suspected of being closeted Christians to lead the services and to curse out the Christians. And therefore, they essentially told all those people, you can't have it both. You have to choose, are you a Jew or are you a Christian? You can't try to be a Judeo-Christian no longer. In addition, in Yavne, they oversaw the first sanctioned official translation of the Torah into Aramaic, done by the nephew of the emperor Titus, known to us as Unculus. And of course, in every Chumash that we see today, you'll notice in the inner margins of the page the Targum, the translation of Unculus. But more than any other mission that the assembly at Yavne had before them was the need and the necessity to establish uniformity in Halacha. Like we spoke about last time, in the century preceding the destruction, the schools of Shammai and Hillel for the first time in Jewish history, were separate and existed concurrently with each other. And therefore, there were questions that were not resolved in the normal fashion and arguments in halacha appeared. At Yavne, the sages undertook the monumental efforts to establish uniform halacha so that there should not be dissent and disunity and division amongst the people. So first things, they spend time clarifying all the laws to make sure that there's uniform practice across the board. But specifically, for three years at Yavne, they debated the schools of Shammai, the schools of Hill, now reunited under one canopy in Yavne. Let's figure this out. Well, who does the halacha follow? Like the, the house of Shammai or like the house of Hillel? 
After three years of vigorous, intensive debate, the conclusion was reached. Elu, va'elu, divrei Elokim Chaim. These and these are the words of a living God. The halacha, kebeis hill. But the halacha, the final practice of the law, follows base Hillel. And after that matter was clarified, there was no schism and there was no factionalism, and they remain united, and everyone agreed the halacha follows base Hillel. Now, during this time, there were several sad, I would say maybe even tragic episodes that happened in Yavne as a result of the need to try to unify Jewish practice and arrive at halacha. And the most famous of those episodes is the episode of Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer, known as Rabbi Eliezer Hagadol, which means Rabbi Eliezer the Great, alternatively Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkunus, Rabbi Eliezer the son of Hurkunus, he was the greatest sage in Yavne. He was greater than the Nasi, he was the teacher of Rabbi Akiva, he was probably the greatest sage at the time, at the end of the first century. Now, during this period, when the Sanhedrin is frequently being disbanded or going underground, there was a question that was posed before the Sanhedrin. But the Sanhedrin did not have a full quorum. There weren't the full 71-member body that gave it the power of the Sanhedrin. And the question that was posed was a very unusual question with regards to the purity and impurity of a serpentine oven that was broken apart and put back together with sand. A very obscure question. And Rabbi Eliezer ruled one way, but the rest of the Sanhedrin, or at least the Sanhedrin members that were there, ruled in the opposite way. And Rabbi Eliezer refused to accede to their position. And he remains steadfast that he's right. And Rabbi Gamaliel, who was the Nasi, he says, wait a minute, we have a Sanhedrin here. And the whole objective that we're trying to achieve is, is uniformity. You have to give in to the ruling of a Sanhedrin. And he says, no, I'm not giving in. And then in a, quite a dramatic development, he starts pulling out all these supernatural proofs. And he says, well, if I'm right, let heaven announce it. And suddenly the whole place hears a heavenly booming voice. Rabbi Lezer's right. Why are you arguing with him? And then he says, if I'm right, let the stream, let the river that's outside start going in the opposite direction. And miraculously, to the astonishment of all those present, the stream turns around and starts heading in the opposite direction. If I'm right, continues Rabbi Lezer, let this tree uproot itself and plant itself a hundred paces yonder. And indeed, that happens. If I'm right, let the walls of the base Medrash prove it. And they all start caving in. They're like, wow, he must be right. But with each one of these supernatural proofs, they say, I'm sorry, the Torah is very clear. Torah is not in the heavens. We follow the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin ruled against you. It doesn't matter what kind of supernatural proofs that you bring. And if you're not willing to give in and accept the ruling of the Sanhedrin, we're going to excommunicate you which is indeed what happened. And to add a tragic layer to the story, Rabban Gamliel, who was the Nasi, and was of the position that if Rabbi Eliezer does not accede to the ruling of the Sanhedrin, then he is going to be excommunicated. He was actually the brother-in-law of Rabbi Eliezer. And they sent Rabbi Akiva to Rabbi Eliezer, and they told him, I'm sorry, you're excommunicated, no one could talk to you, no one could walk in within four Amos of you, four cubits of you, and indeed until the rest, until the end of his life, the greatest sage of his time, Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkunus, was in a state of excommunication, which meant that he was really dissociated from the rest of the Sanhedrin. However, this indeed shows that the focus was single-minded in the Sanhedrin to try to stamp out dissent. And even though Rabbi Ezer was a dear friend and relative of Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Gamliel felt that his role as the head of the Sanhedrin at this critical time in Jewish history was to remove dissent, even if it means going to these very harsh extremes of excommunicating his own brother-in-law, who was one of the leaders, after all, of the Sanhedrin and the greatest sage of his era. 
the Talmud actually says that Rabbi Gamaliel himself was in a boat traveling to Rome, and the boat started swinging wildly in the raging seas, and he knew that God's getting back at him for attacking Rabbi Yezer, and he says, to, he says, he prays out to God and says, I wasn't doing it for me or for my family or for my honor or for the Nazis. I was just doing it for the Jewish people. So there shouldn't be disunity and the waters calmed down. Now, Rabbi Yezer knew that the Sanhedrin, when they rule, that has complete authority. And the, the, the halacha is you follow the majority rules. But his position was that, well, because there wasn't the quorum, he doesn't have that same authority. Whereas Rabbi Gamliel said, yes, it doesn't have the same authority, maybe, but because I'm here, because the Nasi is here, it still has, it's still considered as the full Sanhedrin, and therefore you have to listen to me. There were two other episodes where Rabbi Gamliel asserted his authority, both of them in opposition to the other member of the triumvirate, Rabbi Yehoshua, and eventually he was fired from being Nasi. And in their place, they had a question. Now the Sanhedrin is leaderless. Rabbi Gamliel, the great-grandson of Hillel, he's been fired because of his treatment of Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi, and Rabbi Yezer. But who to appoint in his stead? If you appoint Rabbi Yeshua, well, that seems like an affront to Rabbi Gamliel. You can't appoint Rabbi Akiva because he's a descendant of converts. In the end, they decided to appoint Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, who was only 18 at the time, and that way it wouldn't be a slight to Rabbi Gamliel. In the end, Rabbi Gamliel apologized for his treatment of Rabbi Yoshua. His position was restored. And from that point forward, they had a like an agreement like a senior rabbi and a junior rabbi or assistant rabbi where Rabbi Gamliel would lecture three out of four weeks. And Rabbi Eliezer ben, Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah, who was appointed to replace Rabbi Gamliel, he would lecture, and he would be at the helm for 25% of the time. For that fourth week, he would be the one to give the lecture. But certainly history recognizes Rav Gamliel and the Sanhedrin at Yavne, that they, their objective and their goal was only to restore the national unity, and they recognized that a strong Sanhedrin led by a strong Nasi was the only way to do that. With this new leadership, and national mission, the Jewish people rebuilt, and quite fast, very soon after the destruction, they were as strong, maybe even stronger, than they were prior to the destruction. And I think, you know, maybe we can even argue that in modern times, something similar has happened. The Jewish nation was dealt uh, the worst blow given to any nation during the Holocaust, the worst genocide in all of human history, was perpetrated against our people, 70 years ago. And what happened? We rebuilt. And you can make the argument that the Jewish people today are maybe even stronger than we were on the eve of the Holocaust. Again, this is something that's debatable. But the, there is an argument to be made that counting all factors, we're actually stronger today than we were prior to that devastation. Similar things happened in the first and second century. The Jewish people were battered, they were ravaged, they were savaged, but they rebuilt. And this, again, was not accepted pleasantly by the Romans. In the year 117, Hadrian becomes emperor, and he initially is quite gracious to the Jews, but ultimately he reveals a very dark side, and he institutes crippling decrees he basically takes a page out of Antiochus' playbook and he forbids the laws of Nida, studying Torah publicly, Shabbos, Brismila, circumcision. He forces those who've had a circumcision to undo it. He rebuilds Jerusalem as a pagan city. He institutes a pagan deity on Temple Mount. He bans Jews from entering Jerusalem and Temple Mount on pain of death. And this, of course, sparks the most successful of all revolts, the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. This was a bloody and horrible war for both sides. Shimon Bar Kokhba, he is the leader of this Jewish resistance group in the year 132, a man of tremendous strength and, and, and a great scholar, someone who Rabbi Akiva 
who at the time was the greatest sage of, of the nation. He thought he was a good candidate to be the Messiah. And remarkably, they succeed in recapturing Jerusalem and evicting the Romans from much of the land. But that only heightens Hadrian's resolve to strike at the Jews. He recalls his general, Julius Severus from Britain. They repel and quell the revolt. They recapture Jerusalem and the forces of Bar Kokhba, who have now fortified themselves in the city of Betar, are destroyed. And according to Jewish sources and Roman sources, we both agree that close to a million Jews were slaughtered in the middle of the 130, so 135, 136. And after the war, there was an intense shmad, which is an effort to try to kill the Jewish religion brought about by Hadrian. He began, or he continued, the policy of executing rabbis, most famously Teich Rabbi Ativa, who was an elderly sage, well over a hundred. He has him flayed alive. Rabbi Hanania ben Tradion is surrounded by wood and bur- wrapped in a Torah scroll and burnt publicly in a torturing, in, in a gruesome and macabre and torturing manner. And it's been argued that the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva were also killed during this purge, although the simple reading of the text of that story seems to imply that they died in a supernatural way. Regardless, the Talmud there says that there was only five students left. The Sanhedrin, the great rabbis, everything's destroyed. There's five students now to rebuild. Thankfully, these five students are some of the great sages of the time, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, alternatively known as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua. And this, again, shows how perilous the time for Jewish nation broadly, but certainly for the Sanhedrin, how difficult this time is going to be. Because at a whim, the Roman emperor could decide we're killing you all out, and all there is is five students left. And in fact, one of the things that Hadrian forbade was the conveyance of smicha. Like we said in part one, in order to be part of the Sanhedrin, and certainly in order to have a Sanhedrin, you have to have smicha, which is direct rabbinic ordination from Moshe to Joshua and on throughout the generation, throughout the millennia, until rabbi to student, until, until the time of that individual. And they, the Romans, instituted a decree that whoever gives smicha is going to be executed. Whoever receives smicha is going to be executed. Moreover, in typical Roman cruelty, in a city in which smicha is conferred, the entire city, men, women, and children, all innocent, all civilians, everyone's going to be killed as well. And they realize that the, the, the actual way to undercut the Jewish nation is to go after the rabbis, go after the Sanhedrin, go after smicha. And these five students of Rabbi Akiva, they don't have smicha yet. And these are the last hopes. All the other rabbis are assassinated. We're talking about the year 136 or 137 or so. And there was one elderly rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba. He decided to make a move. And he took these five students and he went exactly between two cities, between the cities of Usha and Shfaram. And he takes these five students, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yossi, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shamu, and perhaps also Rabbi Rabbi Nehemiah, and he gives them smicha. The problem is, is that the Jewish Christians were watching, and they were collaborating with the Romans. And as soon as they saw them gathered together, they whistled to the Romans who started attacking. And this old rabbi, not going to be able to make it, he tells the students, run and flee. You are the future of the Jewish nation. Survive. He himself is captured by the Romans, and they kill him in a really horrific, brutal, grisly fashion by peppering him with spears. But 
What does this mean? It means that the Jewish people live to see another day. And the Sanhedrin and Smicha is maintained a little bit further into the next generation. And the next generation of leadership by uh, led by Rabbi Shimon Gamliel and ultimately by Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, known to us as Rabbi Judah the Prince, there's going to be another rebirth of the Sanhedrin. The Talmud tells us that on the day that Rabbi Akiva died, Rabbi Judah the Prince was born. And he is going to become the Nasi in the end of the second century. And he is going to be uniquely positioned to orchestrate a major innovation that changed the Jewish people forever, but ultimately saved the Jewish people. The Talmud tells us that he was the first person since the times of Moshe who combined both material wealth and Torah greatness in one. Says the Talmud in the book of Gittin, page 59a, from the times of Moshe until the times of Rabbi Judah the Prince, there was never a single person that had Torah, Vigdullah, B'matram Echad. That was the richest Jew and the greatest Torah scholar in one. Moshe was like that. The next person, the end of the second century and beginning of the third century, Rabbi Judah the Prince. In addition, he was quite friendly with the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. And in fact, the Talmud tells us that his official residence of the Nasi was close to the palace of Antoninus that created a tunnel connecting the two. And the great emperor, Marcus Aurelius, was known as the philosopher emperor. He would sneak underground and study Torah with Rabbi Judah, the prince. And in fact, the Talmud records a series of debates that they had on various matters of theology, philosophy, eschatology, and whatnot. And according to Jewish sources, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus actually converted to Judaism in secret. But this unique combination of abilities and relationships, coupled with a relative lull in Roman aggression, allowed Rabbi Judah the Prince and his Sanhedrin, located in Bet Sha'arim and later at Sipori, this is in northern Israel, they were able to undertake the most ambitious project in Jewish history, the writing of the Mishnah. As we said in part one, the primary responsibility of the Sanhedrin is to ensure the accurate perpetuation of oral Torah. This group of scholars, the greatest rabbis and scholars of the world, connected by uninterrupted smicha since the times of Moshe, they're going to be the guardians of the oral Torah and answer and resolve any questions or doubts that arose. But during that time, the Sanhedrin realized that they were very close to losing that continuity in the 130s. And now it's maybe okay, thanks to Rabbi Judah the Prince and his Sanhedrin and Marcus Aurelius and his tolerance, but they 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 knew that the, that, that equilibrium is not going to last for forever. The Romans are going to continuously terrorize the Jews, and the students are also decreasing. And critically, many Jews are leaving the harsh conditions in Israel and moving to Babylon. And this brain drain is going to affect all the scholars and the Sanhedrin specifically in Israel, which can only exist in Israel if the greatest Torah sages are moving progressively towards Babylon, the Sanhedrin's primacy is maybe numbered. And therefore, they decided to create a handbook of Jewish law that could be rapidly studied and transported if needed. And they decided to commit the Mishnah the authoritative book of Jewish law to writing. And of course, today it exists and the scale is monumental. 63 books broken down into six sections, a collaboration of thousands of rabbis written quite tersely in order to preserve the flavor and the scholarship of oral Torah. In addition, it's only the laws. There's vast amounts of the oral Torah that were unwritten, leaving room for future generations to codify the Talmud and Halacha. And this incredible multi-decade effort was undertaken by the Sanhedrin, even though, 
Ironically, they recognized that this would weaken its position. Because, in essence, the Mishnah is going to be a portable version of the Sanhedrin. A portable version of the authoritative version of Torah law that's going to carry the same weight as the Sanhedrin itself. And then when the Talmud is written uh, several centuries later, it's going to continue that precedent. Which is, by the way, why that the Mishnah and the Talmud are considered unimpeachable and completely authoritative because they are a written manifestation of the Sanhedrin, i.e. of the body of sages and scholars and tradition, that line of preserving the oral Torah. After Rabbi Judah the Prince passes in the beginning of the 3rd century, there's going to be eight of his descendants that are going to hold the title of Nasi but none of them are going to have the impact that he had. Moreover, after his passing, the Sanhedrin's role in stewarding the nation will steadily decline for several reasons. First of all, like we mentioned earlier, the greatest Torah center is going to be in Babylon. In addition, the Romans will continue to inflict tremendous persecution upon the Jews in Israel. Also, the Sanhedrin is not going to be the only game in town. After Rabbi Judah the Prince passed, many of the great scholars are going to open up their own institutions. The Sanhedrin is going to have competition. It's not going to be the only school in town where great rabbis gather together to clarify oral Torah. So yes, they're still going to be there, and they're still going to answer questions, and they're, going to, they're still going to be a spiritual guides to the nation, and they're going to oversee the inauguration of the new moons, etc., but they're not going to undertake anything like the sweeping overhaul of Jewish life that the writing of the Mishnah amounted to. When Rabbi Judah the Prince passed, he split up his leadership amongst three people. The Talmud tells us in the book of Tsubas, page 103, A and B, a very lengthy and interesting account of Rabbi Judah the Prince's passing. But he tells all those that are there, my son Shimon is going to be the Chacham, the sage. My son Gamliel is going to be the Nasi. And my student Hanina bar is going to be the head of the Sanhedrin. Thus, again, we see that no longer is there going to be this one man, one Nasi, the head of the Sanhedrin, who's also the greatest Torah scholar, it's going to be split up. His son, he's still the Nasi, Rabbi Gamliel, Bey Rebbe, he's called. He's only mentioned a few times in the Talmud of the Mishnah. His Sanhedrin is going to make several edicts, as did the one of his son and successor, Rabbi Yehuda Nesia. But ultimately, none of them are going to have that same vibrant Sanhedrin and unquestioned leadership that their father and grandfather had. They're going to spend a lot of their efforts to continue to refine the Mishnah to clarify all its unresolved questions. They're going to make other edicts with respect to divorces, an interesting one with respect to the oil of Gentiles. There's a, a, some beautiful stories about these leaders. Uh, one very nice one I'll tell you from the book of Tinus, page 24a. It tells a story about Rabbi Judah the Prince's grandson, whose also name was Rabbi Judah the Prince, but he's called Rabbi Judah Nesia. There was a time where there was a drought. There was no rain. And when there was no rain, the Nasi is in charge of finding a solution. What do you do? You pray and you fast. So he makes a decree in the whole Jewish world in Israel, everyone needs to fast and pray so that we could try to intercede upon our behalf and get the Almighty to give us rain. So he makes this fast and everyone starts fasting and no rain comes. And he starts lamenting and crying, how different am I than Samuel, my predecessor more than a thousand years prior, who was the leader of the Jews. Samuel prayed for rain at a time where rain never comes in the land of Israel. And it happened. It started pouring all across the land. And here I'm praying at a time where rain is supposed to come, nothing doing and he's so sad. He's like, I feel so bad for our generation. All they have is me as their leader. And because he was so sad and so humble, rain started to fall. 
there's other stories about him as well. But this uh, shows that he's acknowledging that he's not his father, he's not his grandfather. These are not the same leaders. No longer is the Nasi going to be the unquestioned greatest Torah scholar, and the Sanhedrin itself is going to wane in influence. However, after he passes, after Budenasiya passes, his son is going to be Rabban Gamaliel. So this is a little bit confusing because there's going to be five Rabban Gamaliels and a whole bunch of Rabbi Yehudas and a whole bunch of Hillels and a whole bunch of Shimons because they all have the same names. Uh, rough all told, there's going to be about 15 people who carry that title, all of them father after son, uh, son after father. But during the reign of Rabban Gamaliel ben Yehuda, who's the great grandson of Rabbi Judah the Prince, the Sanhedrin and the office of the Nasi are going to diverge and separate for, separate forever. The Nasi will remain the official political representative of the Jews in Israel, and the Sanhedrin will also remain as a body of Torah scholarship, but they're separate. And this development actually weakens both offices because the Nasi is no longer associated with the great scholars of the Sanhedrin, the rank-and-file Jews stop seeing the Nasi as their leader. And the Sanhedrin itself is now bereft of the Nasi. It lost its most important component. Even when Moshe founded the Sanhedrin, he said that there's 70 plus one. There's always the 70 scholars of the Sanhedrin, and then there's a Nasi on top of them. Now there is no Nasi to lead the Sanhedrin, and its prominence is diminished as well. In addition... The Sanhedrin continued to be just one of the many yeshivos that existed in Israel. Each of the senior scholars are founding their own institutions that are going to operate alongside and concurrently in competition with the Sanhedrin. And of course, the exodus to Babylon is going to continue apace. Now, in hindsight, it's actually important to stress that this decision, certainly in Israel, to open up all these other competing institutions and not have the Sanhedrin as the sole place where all the rabbis gather, was a calculated decision. The sages of the time recognized that the threats to Jewish continuity were very real, and they adopted a decentralized system. Let the rabbis and the institutions be scattered all over the land, and that way we can ensure our safety. But it also marks the end of the Sanhedrin as the authoritative body of the greatest scholars who have the final say in adjudicating halacha. So, for example, the greatest sage of the third century in Israel is Rabbi Yochanan. He has his own institution, not related to the Sanhedrin. And in the third and fourth century, the Sanhedrin and indeed, Torah in Israel is going to progressively decline. And there's going to be a turning point in the 350s that's going to essentially end the Sanhedrin as it was constituted. And that's because the conditions in the land really deteriorated and Roman persecution, now mixed with a Christian zeal zealotry, is going to intensify. And the emperor, Constantinius Gallus, along with his henchmen, or Sicinus, they massacred many of the remaining Jews who lived in Israel. And this, these conditions made it impossible to maintain yeshiva of any sort, certainly not the Sanhedrin, with the office of smicha perpetuating from generation to generation. And the Nasi at the time, his name was Hillel II, he made a fateful decision that saved the day. Because the most important thing that we needed the Sanhedrin for at the time, it wasn't the safeguarding of the oral tradition. That was done primarily in Babylon, by the sages in Babylon. But we needed it for the regulation of the Jewish calendar. And to ensure that we know which months are comprised of 29 days and which ones of 30 days, that you needed to have the Sanhedrin with smicha oversee. And now 
that the days of the Sanhedrin and of Smicha are numbered, Hillel II preemptively is going to consecrate all the new months forever, and he's going to establish a system of leap years forever, and to automate the calendar in a way that it can it can exist and continue to exist without the Sanhedrin. And this is going to be the final act of the Sanhedrin around the year 358 or 359. The Sanhedrin is going to be disbanded, and it's been disbanded ever since. The office of the Nasi is going to continue for about 70 years or so until that institution is also going to cease. Torah is going to flourish in Babylon. The Jews will be stronger than ever in Babylon, but Torah in Israel is going to continually decline and the Sanhedrin is no longer. Now, the problem for us today is that if we ever want to reinstitute a Sanhedrin, we have to reinstitute smicha. And of course, like we said, if there is a break in the chain, you no longer have it uninterrupted from the times of Moshe, how could you possibly restart it? And there really isn't any development on that front for many hundreds of years until the Rambam addresses this question in the laws of Sanhedrin that he codifies chapter 4, Halacha 11. And he writes like this, It appears to me that if all the sages in the land of Israel agree to appoint judges and to give them smicha, behold, you could do that, you could give them smicha. And they, in turn, could give smicha to other people. What the Rambam here does in this one short sentence is provide the framework for restarting smicha. And once you restart smicha, you can restart the Sanhedrin too. All you need is every single rabbi in the land of Israel to agree that it's proper to restart smicha. And his reasoning for this, he elaborates in the his commentary Mishnah, is quite simple. Like we said, there's no way to reconvene a Sanhedrin. You need to have smicha uninterrupted. And therefore, there must be a way around this. And that, that's his solution, that you could reconvene, get all the rabbis to agree, restart smicha, and then restart the Sanhedrin. Now, no one actually pulled the trigger on this plan until the 1530s. In the 1530s, really this whole 16th century, there was a renaissance in Israel, in northern Israel, in Tzfat. Some of the greatest rabbis of the whole era were coalesced in a small city in the northern Israel called Tzfat. Many great sages like the Arizal, who gave new meaning to Kabbalah, his students, the Alshech, Reb Chaim Vital, and of course, the greatest codifier of halacha since Maimonides, Rabbi Yosef Cairo, who came to Israel after fleeing from Spain and the expulsion of the 1490s. And Rabbi Yaakov Beirab, he assembled 25 of the leading rabbis of the city, and they decided to reinstitute smicha based upon this teaching in the Rambam. And they managed to give smicha to Rabbi, ya- Rabbi Yaakov Beirav and Rabbi Yosef Cairo and Rabbi Moshe Alshech and Rabbi Chaim Vital, some of the great sages of the time. And everything seems like it was underway to restart smicha worldwide and to reconvene the Sanhedrin. The problem is that the rabbis in Jerusalem weren't so happy about that. And they said, wait a minute. Read the Rambam. The Rambam says quite clearly, you have to have all the rabbis in, you know, of the land of Israel to sign off on this. We don't. We don't agree. You have to stop it. And thus, the program was aborted after giving spicha to only four rabbis. And this actually led to a controversy spreading throughout the Jewish world. Many positing that it's something we shouldn't do. Let's wait for Messiah. This is has kind of a messianic tinge to it. Only Messiah could revive Smicha and the Sanhedrin. It's interesting, the Radvaz, who was a contemporaneous rabbi who lived in Egypt at the time, and he actually also wrote a commentary on the Rambam, along with many thousands of halachic responses to various questions. 
in his commentary to this Rambam, he writes that he doesn't like it. He doesn't agree with the Rambam for several reasons. One of them, he also references in his commentary, like this is what the rabbis and Tzfat, when they wanted to restart Smicha on the Sanhedrin, this is what they relied upon, but you can't really rely on it. And he writes, to be to have Smicha, you, the, the person who receives Smicha has to be an expert in all areas of Torah. And it seems to me far-fetched in our generation that there could be someone who is an expert in all of Torah. And then he says, well, as to Rambam's reasoning that, well, how are we ever going to restart Smicha and restart the Sanhedrin? He comes up with two solutions. He says, well, first of all, we know that Elijah the prophet, he had Smicha because he lived 2,700 years ago. And we know that the Midrash says that before Messiah comes, Elijah the prophet is going to come back to life. And because he received smicha earlier back in the chain, straight from Moses, he could give smicha to other people. And that's a way to start, it's an organic way, so to speak, to restart smicha and restart the Sanhedrin without resorting to the Rambam solution. In addition, he posits that maybe there's pockets of Jews that we're not aware of. He calls them the Bnei Ruvain, but probably he's talking about the Ten Lost Tribes, that maybe they exist independent of the Jewish world, and they have smich uninterrupted. How do you know? And if they come back, they could be the key to bringing back smicha without following the Rambam solution of just restarting it from nothing. So ultimately, that plan didn't really go very far. And there were other attempts uh, to reinstitute smicha and reestablish the Hedron over the years. Rabbi Yisrael of Shkolov, who was one of the students of the Goan of Vilna, he sent messengers to Yemen, a land isolated for thousands of years from the rest of the Jewish world. And he sent them there in the 1930s to see if there's someone there who still had smicha. They found no one. Uh, the rabbi of Cairo, Rabbi Aaron Mendel Hakohen, attempted it in 1901. Interestingly, when the state was founded in 1948, there were various efforts by Rabbi Yudalib Maimon, who was the leader of the religious Zionist movement and also Israel's first minister of religious affairs, he tried to establish a Sanhedrin in conjunction with the founding of the new state. That, too, didn't work out. There is a group today that calls themselves the New Sanhedrin. They only have like five or six members, but they are recruiting. So you can send them an email if you want to join. Uh, but they don't really have much broad backing in the greater Jewish world. Most people today, you tell them about the Sanhedrin, they have no idea what you're talking about. They assume you're talking about the Book of Talmud or the ancient Sanhedrin. Uh, there's one more thing to note here. In 1806, the French emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, he decided to revive the Sanhedrin in somewhat of a twisted and bizarre plan. This was not to give the Jewish people sovereignty or autonomy. Rather, he wanted to reinforce the Jewish people's commitment and loyalty to France. And he said, we're going to gather 71 Jewish sages and we're going to call them the Sanhedrin. And whatever they say is binding because the Sanhedrin is binding. That was his plan. And he asked them a whole series of questions. Uh, they met for like a month or two. Uh, they themselves didn't consider themselves the Sanhedrin, but they had to come because Napoleon forced them to come. And after they answered the questions posed to them, they disbanded. In conclusion, we could say quite uh, definitively after our discussion and our exploration of the Sanhedrin throughout the centuries and millennia, the Sanhedrin played a vital role for the Jewish people to maintain and perpetuate the Oral Torah accurately. Thankfully, before the greatest sages of the Jewish nation ceased, they gave us portable versions first in the Mishnah, and in the Talmud, and thus the ideal and priority and role of the Sanhedrin is maintained in the written versions of the Oral Torah, the Mishnah, and the Talmud. They had a glorious past. Hopefully, they'll have a very bright future sometime soon. How exactly that's going to be restarted? How are we going to get smicha on the Sanhedrin once again? We'll have to wait and see.